Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Saturday, February 15th, for our blended learning open mic topic. This is a first that we don't have a, a special guest today. Uh, our show hosts are Peggy George, Lori Moffat, that's me, and Tammy Moore. Tammy usually does closed captioning, and thank you for that, but today she's going to participate. The special guest. Anyone who would like to take the mic and join in the conversation today. So the room is the group of special guests today. This is the live binder for today's show, um, the open mic blended learning binder. Notice that the links are on the left column rather than across the top of the live binder. And Peggy's placed the link into the chat. All the recordings are posted on the Archives and Resources page, which is at live.classroom20.com, archive slash and, or dash and, and resources.html. Uh, they're all posted there. And we always like to find out where in the world people are log logging in from. So if you use the pointer as I am, it's the second tool down in the whiteboard tools. Um, I'm in central Pennsylvania. Uh, Tammy's logging in from southwest Arkansas. Peggy's in Phoenix, Arizona. Paula Noggle's going to be facilitating the, the conversation, and she's in New Orleans. We have some international people logging in today. There's a clump in Arizona, it looks like. All right, we do have some polling questions. And again, you use the choices that are up near the top. First one is, have you ever taken the, the mic to participate in an online webinar? Either yes or no. And once people have voted, I will post this to the, the results to the whiteboard. And those from those that voted, most everyone, almost three quarters, 73%, have indeed taken the mic to participate. The next polling question, have you ever participated in an EdCamp event where the focus is on conversations rather than presentations. Again, the green check is yes, the red X is no. And I will post these to the whiteboard. And we're half and half, half yes, half no, from those that voted, 45% each. Our next question, are you using blended learning in your classroom? And I'll post these responses. 54% voted yes, they are. Again, I'd like to welcome you all to our topic today, which is an open mic session. And everybody in the room are the, the guests. The topic's blended learning. Um, Anyone who would like to take the mic and join the conversation will. And I will now, I think, pass the mic over to Paula Noggle, who will facilitate the discussion today. Good morning, everyone. This is Paula from New Orleans. 
I'm so glad to have so many people here, and I was excited to see that most of you have taken a mic somewhere in the past, and that's great. So our newbie question is, what is an open mic session? And basically what I am thinking about when I think of the answer to this is that um, it's like attending an ed camp facilitated discussion. So there isn't one presenter who is um, you know, giving us information about a, a tool or something they do in particular in their class. It's all of us asking questions, sharing advice, uh, best practices, things that have worked, have not worked for us as we have gone down the blended um, learning pathway. And if you haven't done so yet, hopefully you will get a lot of thoughts and ideas today that will help you do so. And what we mean by open mic is that each person in this room will at some point, hopefully, actually raise their hand and respond. Because some of the questions are, uh, uh, we're trying to take a deeper dive today. And instead of typing in a great big long thing in um, the chat room, we thought it would be nice to hear our, our different voices on the mic and during in the recording. So the pressure's on a little bit, but we know that you are all wonderful participants, and we would just absolutely love to hear from each and every one of you. So let's get started. Okay, when you think of the term blended learning, what comes into your mind? What are your thoughts? What do you think it means? And guess what? I don't think there are any wrong answers to this at all. So who's going to be brave and raise their hand first? Thank you, Tammy. And Tony, Tammy, I'm going to get off and let you take the mic. I figured since there's a little little moment there where no one raised their hand, I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to jump in. <laughs> so really basically having part, part where you've got the convenience of being able to be online, at home, at your own convenience, in your pajamas. I've already seen lots of people putting in PJs <laughs> where, you, where you can just be relaxed and enjoy and, and just take breaks when you want to. And then the other part is the face-to-face, -face where you get to have not only the hands-on experiences, and sometimes the face-to-face -face is because some of the equipment's expensive. So if you've got a, a class where it would be too expensive for each individual to have that item, for instance, I, I'm thinking of science-oriented classes especially. And getting together allows that hands-on with some of the tools that wouldn't otherwise be available. Or just to be able to have the, the hands-on where you've got that group collaborative experience. Thank you, Tammy. Um, Tony, you're up next. Thank you. I was thinking the same thing that came, Tammy was talking, but I was also thinking about what Doug just put in the chat. Flipped learning is a type of blended learning, and I have some teachers looking into that. But I really think blended learning to me means sometimes being online and sometimes not. And I'm a librarian now, and I almost think that our ebooks and our research that sometimes we're assigning to kids is a little bit of that blended learning. Thank you for that, Tony. Um, I'm going to add my two cents here. What I think of when I think of blended learning is I teach fourth grade, and I like to extend the learning day beyond our classroom. So I use a learning management system called Edmodo, where I put assignments that the students can access at home on their computer, which is great for those that have access. So the question always comes up, what do you do for the children who don't have, have access? Well, I do a rotation in my classroom where uh, one of the rotations is computer time every day. So if the kids can't access from home, they can access from in, within our classroom as part of what I'm doing, a very moderated flip in my fourth grade. So they do have access to computers within the classroom, and some of their instruction comes through their Edmodo group where they go, they access the assignment, and they do the work kind of independently. And if they don't get to do it right then, some of us ask to stay in from PE to do some things they need to catch up on. Or they do it in the morning during homeroom time. 
or sometimes they just, you know, they figure it out. They, they borrow somebody's, um, you know, computer and get things done. So it's really working out great for me. Anyone else? All right, Maureen, take the mic, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Maureen. Sorry, my mic must have been off. Um, what? I, I never thought of blended learning as something that the kids did. I really thought of it as something that I was doing as an adult, taking an online class and having you know, face-to-face -face meetings, but mostly online. But the more that I've been looking at it and reading about it, looking at the different definitions that have really emerged more recently about what blending learning is, I really feel like it's a way to personalize learning for kids, that you can take blended learning, have kids do things in class, have things discussions take place on Edmodo, and it really gives you a, a way to differentiate instruction and to personalize learning. Yes, I love that, Marie. One of the things that I find is that um, you know, the, the kids that are the ones, you know, whose hands eagerly waving in the air sometimes get too much um, playtime as far as, you know, being able to talk in the class. And it's the quiet, shy ones who don't always have their voices heard. But if you have some kind of a learning management system where everyone's invited to the discussion whenever they can, you know, type in their response, then they all have a chance to have their say. And I love when the kids have a back and forth conversation on a topic. All right, let's move on to the next question. Okay, now we would like you to share a story or description of how you are using blended learning in your classroom. And I'm, ho oh, hi Jan. And I'm sure hoping that um, my friend Louise in Texas will share, because I know she does awesome things with her second graders. Jan's at an appointment, and she said she'd try to take the mic if she could, and we'll see how that goes. So raise your hand, and please share or, you know, tell us some stories. Thank you. Okay, it looks like Shannon is up first. Let's see, Shannon's in Audio Setup Wizard. How about we go to Tony? Oh, there, she's out now. I Shannon, just push the talk uh, button on. I got it. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Shannon, you were there and then we lost you. Uh, push the talk button again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We are hearing okay. you great. All right. Thank you. Um, sorry for that. Yeah, I use it. I'm a high school teacher. I teach French and Spanish. Uh, the French I teach in Florida, so French is a hard sell. Um, in order to um, keep the program going, the French program and, and other languages going, when there's a, a small amount of kids that want to take that course, I started blended learning uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I love it, and I love the comment that Maureen made that it's uh, personalized. So what I've offered to the school is we could have one class period where my uh, French 1, French 2, French 3, even if there are only a couple kids in there. And so the, that's not blended, the fact that they're all together, but the fact that the course, the French 1, French 2, that those are blended has proved to be uh, really great. Uh, it is personalized and allows me to work with each level, having them work uh, Either uh, researching or um, I use the I use the online text for uh, for a basis. So they have the audio, they have the exercises, but I can direct them and I can give them supplemental material and so forth. So I've loved that we use a learning platform, um, and um, it, it's turned out great. I think it's wonderful. Thank you so much, Sharon. Okay, Tony, you're up next.
Okay, I think Tony put her hand down. Um, Aunt Tammy, sure. looks like you are the next one. Well, I, uh, I'm an English teacher. I teach ninth grade English. And some of the things that I just use as standards, I use something called noredink.com. And the kids have a, st have a standing assignment on there that they do every week. And I'm able to look at it, uh, look at how it tells me how each individual is doing so I can make assignments, uh, further assignments for those who need it. So that gives me a, a way to individualize their learning a bit. I also use something called classtools.net to create games for them to learn. And um, then we use uh, the discussion page on turnitin.com. So those are some of the tools that I use with my ninth graders to learn both in class and outside of class. Awesome. Just heard about No Red Ink recently. Thank you for sharing that. All right, Patty, you're up next. Hi everybody, I'm uh, a tech teacher uh, and I have classes with grades 3 to 8 and um, just some examples of what I think I'm doing that uh, falls in the blended learning, learning category. I can't really do flipped because nobody thinks they should ever have to do work for a minor subject outside of class even if it's watching a video. So um, I incorporate tools that they can use as an option. Um, for example, in third grade, I made a, a Google Earth tour for them, and I have some little paragraphs, but I also inserted, um, I think I might have used Audioboo, and if they wanted the paragraph read to them, they could click on that, and then that was a way to differentiate for those kids who, um, you know, needed that little extra help without me being there. Um, also, I'm working on grading some assignments, and I'm putting in um, I'm actually doing screencasting of their uh, assignment and I'm going over each item and explaining to them what they did correctly or incorrectly so I can um, give them some positive feedback as well as point out what they may have done incorrectly. And then a lot of times what I'll do is I will create a video of the steps uh, involved in a certain project and the funny thing that I found now, um, I expected, and this happens, that they will go back and watch these videos in, through the course of the project if they forget how to do something. But I've started to actually introduce the lesson by playing the video because they pay more attention to me on video than they do if I'm explaining to them in person. So I, I kind of have a captive audience that way. So th those are my examples. Thank you so much for sharing. All right, Tony, it's your turn. Okay, All right. can I try now? Okay, thank you. Um, I am really passionate about global collaboration, and I've done a lot of work. I spent a year uh, teaching at an international school in China, and that's when I started doing a lot of it. I started with high schoolers doing some flat classroom projects. And I, um, at my China school, I even did it with preschoolers because then I was back down at the elementary level. And we had preschoolers. We connected someone from America to our Chinese classroom. And they learned about transportation. And they each had to learn a different song about transportation. And then they Skyped each other. Um, the American school came in in the evening and Skyped with the Chinese school. And it was just so great for those even little ones to be able to connect. But my second grade team right now is doing a lot with uh, Skyping. They Skype with um, Heather Davis' school in Guatemala, and they're Skyping with other schools and connecting. And a lot of my connections right now seem to be coming from Kid Blog also, which is, I'm not sure if it could be under here, but I think it can because kids, I'm um, talking about, um, Patty just talked about kids don't, can't do homework at home. Well, we introduce kids to Kid Blog, and we're telling them they can go on, but they don't have to at home. And so many of them have gone on and done book reports that weren't assigned or just writing that wasn't assigned. And connecting schools from around the world uh, using Kid Blog has just been a great way to do it. I love using Kid Blog. And when you do that, um, if you're on Twitter, 
don't forget to use the hashtag comments for kids to increase the number of comments your kids will get on their blogs by teachers, educators around the world who follow that hashtag. All right, Donna, you're up next. Thank you. Oh, I just love Kid Blog too. Tony's one of our partners in our class in Illinois. And we do a lot of project-based learning in my classroom. And I love the blended learning format to give the kids a little background. It's really, you know, they should in, in project-based learning, kids should be learning the content as they explore it. But they do need to have some background knowledge. They, want, they don't even know what questions to ask when they start out, no matter how good you plan it. I teach fifth grade. So I use Brain Pop, and sometimes I'll, I'll use other resources and assign little videos that they can watch either in class um, during open time or at home for homework. So when they come to approach a project-based learning um, assignment, they have some background, and that, that's been real helpful this year. Thank you so much, Donna. All right, Doug Henry, we are excited that you're taking the mic. Take it away. Well, I don't know how exciting this will be, but I teach online for a college in Missouri. And one of my first assignments was to teach the online portion of a blended chemistry course. So for a couple of days a week, the students would come into the college and do their lab experiments and everything. And then I handled the homework and grading and things like that online. It worked pretty well, but it only lasted for a couple of seasons. I think the problem was that the classroom teachers didn't have a real appreciation of online learning. So uh, we don't have that class anymore. I teach uh, third through eighth graders at a, at a school here. And we're gradually moving into some flipped learning and some I, some afternoon uh, computer club things and stuff like that. So that's my experience. Thank you so much, Doug, for sharing. All right, next up um, is Tammy Moore. Hey, I thought I would throw in some experiences from the homeschool area. So since it's actually been pretty common in the homeschool realm, to have a blend. A good example I wanted to share with you is what the Landry Academy is doing. It was started by a professor of anatomy in North Carolina. And he homeschools his own two daughters. And the local community began asking, you, can, can we get together and you lead something where we do the hands-on stuff? And so at first, that's what it was. Is once a week or once a month or so, the homeschoolers would come and he would lead it. And then gradually, people outside of comfortable travel distance wanted to get involved too. So he began to expand it. He began to teach the on the instructional portion of science he taught in an online classroom setting. And then the students would get together, even if they had to travel, they would get together. Well now they've got about two hundred teachers and several hundred courses. And now they've got people from around the world. And what they do is they teach intensives. That's the hands-on hands -on parts. And then they also have the week-to-week -week and sometimes day-to-day -day classes that you have online in the classroom, just like this one. It's a Blackboard Collaborate. And the intensives are usually about three days. It's sort of like going to a convention would be like. So the families would travel a relatively short distance. It might still take overnights to they might have to get a hotel room. And they would have usually three day intensives. And during the three day intensives they would pack all that hands hands on and uh, collaborative and social time all together. And they usually just rent spaces at universities. So they'll get three days use of they'll they'll sometimes they'll even set up dormitories if they've got a large group. And then the families can stay in the dormitories during the time of the intensives. And they now even have mom intensives. So even homeschool moms can get together. And then they get a lot of support for about three days. And a lot of times they'll run it side, side, side by side with the student intensives. So moms, while they're there, they get the fun of having something for them too. Yeah. And then in our project, um, I run a project called Virtual Homeschool Group. And this is about, the next year will be our 10th year. And we provide a focus for the, the online classes. We also use Blackboard Collaborate. We have Moodle. 
And then what we have as far as the, the blended part is that there are local co-ops dotted around the country where the families get together in their local co-ops, usually about once every two weeks, and they do the labs hands-on. Hands so that one doesn't require quite as much travel. But it does take the initiative of, of at least a mom or two in a local area to form uh, the hands-on part of it. And then the, the kids get together uh, in that local area. And that's especially great for sciences because um, I'm a biology teacher, and it's expensive for the families to get microscopes and dissection gear. And whenever you've got everyone all in one place, you can share some of the expenses related to that. All right, that's my share. All right, thank you so much for that. That's some, um, those are some wonderful examples of things that are going on. All right, let's move on to our next um, question or thought. Uh, what do you need to have available to you in your classroom to try a blending learning model? What are your thoughts? What are the, the, the um, devices or the tools that you think you would have to have um, access to in order for this to work for you? Okay, if you'd like to raise your hand. Thanks, Louise. Okay, it is your turn to share with us. Thank you. Hi, um, I was just uh, wanting to comment on that. Um, for a couple of years, I have been teaching and doing a lot of things in my classroom with very limited technology. We just had a couple laptops. We had access to a computer lab. Um, but my students were also able to connect globally through blogging and Skype and in other ways. And so you really don't need a lot. Um, this past November, though, we were gifted with 10 iPads from our district. So we're piloting. We're the first, uh, one of the first elementary classrooms in our district to be piloting iPads in the classroom. So I've been having a lot of fun um, exploring all of the, the ways that we could incorporate those into our daily workflow. And so um, now that we have them, I'm finding <laughs> well, all the, all the really cool things that we could be doing. So anyway, my point here is that you really don't need a whole lot to do what you need to do. In fact, what we have a class blog. And last year, what I would do is post some little videos or things like that on the class blog so that the students and their parents could watch them at home. And then we could talk about them and discuss them the next day. My kids are second graders, so they don't have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of them don't have their own handheld devices. Some of them do have tablets and things at home, but they don't have the access of, you know, some of the older kids would have. And um, so anyway, so that's how I'm doing it in my classroom. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. And I find that um, one of the things that I do at the beginning of each year to help me understand my um, students and what they have access to and not, is I do a, a Google form survey at the beginning of the year to find out which kids have devices, access, you know, online access at home, uh, which ones are kind of conveniently located to the libraries and things like that. That helps give me a, a picture of what I can and cannot expect from my kids. So I find that helpful. All right, Tony, you are up next. Thank you. I'm just going to piggyback on uh, Louise because my second grade teachers only have a few iPads in their class, but they had the tech teacher help with some Google Docs, and then they came back into their classroom and they were doing a group project on indigenous learning, and they um, each of the kids had a topic like clothing or food or tools, um, and each kid was able to do their typing in Google Docs and then come into the classroom and use Book Creator and put it all together. And again, they don't have a lot of technology, but the teachers posted it on a blog. And parents were emailing in saying how amazing it was that the kids could do that with um, their, the iPads. Because I think most parents see iPads as a consuming device. And as teachers, we really need to push that they are produ producers on technology, just not consuming. So true, Tony. Um, one of the things that I'm excited about with the uh, iPads is that they are becoming devices for students being able to create instead of just consume. And that's a wonderful thing in today's world. 
Oops, sorry, let's move on to the next one. Our next one is, why do you think today's students might prefer a blended learning model to a more traditional classroom model? Give you a second to think about that, then raise your hands and we'll get going. All right, Jan Wells, you are up first. Hi, buddy. Hi, everyone. Sorry to join late. Um, I teach fourth grade in Kansas, and um, blended learning, um, as far as preferring, I think they're more engaged. They have more choice and more options. Um, they do a lot more collaborating um, in this new um, blended learning atmosphere. That's what I think on that question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Jan, for joining. That was great. Uh, Susie, you have the mic next. Um, I think that part of the reason that the kids like the blended learning is that they're like us. Anymore, when we want to know something, we don't want to have to wait. And so if they are empowered with being able to look up the information, that's so much better. So you know, I, I think that's really a part of it. I'm thinking of all our teachers that can hardly put away their cell phones and uh, all of that too. But it's like I want to know and I want to know now and I don't want to have to wait. That is so true. I, I love just watching the faces of my kids when they are using our devices within the classroom, which is quite a mixture this year. But they really enjoy it. All right. Um, Let's see, I have a one next to Jan. I'm not sure if she wants to go again or if we're moving on to Louise. I got a little confused. Okay, we're moving on to Louise. Louise, it's your turn. I didn't realize I raised my hand again, but I'll talk again. Um, I think just by getting the iPads and actually even before the iPads, um, utilizing the computers more in my classroom than just where they could go on and do a little math game or um, some kind of a reading program. When we started using them for blogging and connecting in other ways and creating, um, I, the student engagement was just so much more there. I, you know, it's just they they respond to that format. It's what they're used to. It's what it's how they're learning. It's how they like to learn. And so when the iPads came along, you know, it's just they were completely drawn to them. And um, that's just how our how our kids are learning now, and I think that's what we have to kind of get used to, and have to figure out how to how to meet their needs that way. Yes, they are definitely digital citizens, and we should allow them to have that choice. Thank you so much, Louise. All right, Shannon, it's your turn. All right, I just want to add um, to all the great comments I've heard so far. One of the other things is, and uh, I don't know, I teach high school students, and um, I do think their attention span is not quite as uh, been teaching for many years. I think their attention span is quite different from what it was before. They do like quick, uh, quick answers, quick information. On the other hand, it's very difficult uh, because they're so used to expressing themselves on Facebook and Twitter and so forth that sometimes they do speak before they think. So one of the most difficult parts for me is, yes, they have all this available to them to research, but how do I get them to focus on the research and use what they have to then give uh, thoughtful replies. So that's been, that's been a challenge. And I, I understand and share that thought with you, um, Shannon. I spend about two weeks at the beginning of the school year teaching di digital citizenship and how to participate in an online environment with my fourth graders to try to eliminate some of the silliness that can go on when you give them permission to, to uh, use online services. So I, I find it great because they probably haven't done it in the past. And so that is part of my curriculum now at the very beginning of the school year. All right, Jan, you're up next. Um, yes, I have a question um, maybe related to this. Where students, um, we have this expectation and, and this openness about us and our teaching and their learning, but them not taking, they still, their history before coming into my class with so much to offer that they just don't know how to continue to go on 
without having someone hold their hand or do it for them, letting them, they just don't feel like they, some of them take ownership. They're sitting in the back still. Is there anyone that has an idea on how to, you know, we've openly said, you know, this is where we, what we're doing, this is what we do, take control of it, but they just still rely on the teacher too much to take the control. Is anyone else dealing with this? Okay, I think Tony raised her hand in response to Jan's question. So Tammy, do you mind if I go to Tony first? Oh, definitely. All right, Tony, uh, you have the mic. I had a reluctant fourth grade teacher join Kid Blog just recently. Um, she said she had tried it a few years before and didn't feel like the kids were that into it. Um, she was trying to do weekly assignments where they could um, possibly get it done during class or have to do it at home. And um, I came into her room a few weeks after and we, we tried to talk again. I, you know, I helped with the setup and I helped with a lot of stuff. And she said, I really don't think they're into it. And she said, I want an international audience. And I think that's one thing, Jan, that I think gets my kids is really excited, and not maybe an international audience, but just an audience outside of the school. And, and that's why my passion has become global collaboration, because I think if you can get kids to look outside the walls that we're in, it, it makes them feel more important. So I contacted my old school in China, and the Chinese students are, are just commenting pretty brief stuff. A lot of them are English second language students, so their English isn't great. But um, they're commenting it, and our kids have gone nuts with it, and they're now kind of taking off on their own and doing more things. But I do think a lot of teachers that <coughs> don't prepare kids enough for technology think that they can do it on their own, and I think there's a lot of students who can't. So as I mentioned before, the whole they're good at consuming technology, but they're not good at producing. And as teachers, I think that's so important and that's part of our main job to really make sure that when they are producing online, or and even sometimes when they're consuming, um, I don't remember who the high school teacher was that was just on, they're not as good at, at even consuming research online as they are with consuming other things online. So teaching them the right way to do these things yeah, we don't have to teach them how to use a mouse anymore or even sometimes how to type that well because they know how to do it easy on their own, but teaching them the correct ways to produce and consume online. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Tony. All right, Tammy, the mic is now yours. Thank you. Um, I think for the students, a lot of times the advantages of a blended model is that when they're working independently, if the teacher will build into it the possibilities for them to have a more personalized approach, it can give them more variety than they would have just with a typical homework assignment or a typical classroom time. For instance, you've got a student that is struggling, let's say, with division and doesn't want to embarrass themselves by admitting it in a classroom, even to the teacher, because there are lots of little ears listening in. Um, and they might just keep it keep it secret that they're having trouble. It will show up, of course, in the grades, but they, they just won't ask for help like, like they would need to. If a teacher provides the support in that at-home part of it, the, the other half of the blended learning, so that they're able to get the extra support, it's just right there. So that, for instance, instead of a worksheet going home, blended learning could allow for the technology that could provide that extra support. So if they hit a division problem and they don't know how to do it, you could have a little help button for those students. And then they could hit that help button and they could get an interactive that helps walk them through the steps to help them out. Students that don't need it don't have to take, don't have to be slowed down by that, but those that need it could have it. So I think students that if it's set up right, students could have those extra supports in ways that wouldn't be possible with a traditional model. Thank you, Tammy. That's so true. I don't know um, how many people in the room use 10 marks. It's a uh, math um, website that I use with my students. And when you set up the assignments for your uh, students to use within each question, the questions on kind of like the left panel of the screen and on the right hand um, side of the screen, they have up to three hints 
that they can use or not use, and they also have access to a video that walks them through um, you know, what the question is about, and it's really helpful. And another thing that I've discovered, Tony, is I had to teach um, this year for the first time, well, actually the second time, um, was area model multiplication. And of course, a lot of our parents never went through that process. You know, this is something new coming out of the Common Core State Standards. So having access um, on Edmodo or through your blog or your website or your wiki or whatever you share with your parents to some videos that demonstrate area model multiplication is an awesome way to help the parents get it too so that they don't feel embarrassed, you know, saying, hey, I don't know how to do this in front of their kids, you know. So that's an awesome um, thing to share. All right, uh, let's see. I think, Jan, your hand is up again. Maybe not. All right, let's move on to the next one. What are some tips you could share for planning effective blending learning experiences? If someone came to you and said, I want to start trying to do this in my classroom, where, you know, how would you start them on the path? What would you do? What resources would you share, et cetera? We'd like to start us off with this one. Thanks, Tammy. You are such a wealth of knowledge. Please take the mic. <laughs> I would be saying reuse, 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 because it takes a lot of time the first year as you build the support materials, and you'll end up facing a lot of build year after year after year if you don't start thinking from the very beginning of choosing your tools and building in such a way that you can keep reusing it year after year, because otherwise you're going to exhaust yourself, because it can take a lot of time to get these materials that support them outside of the classroom. So some examples would be videos. There's a whole host of possibilities of where you can host videos that'll stay in place. They'll be there year after year after year after year. And I actually recommend, I know a lot of times in school districts, they'll let you use their server. And if they're not blocking places outside of the, the servers that are provided, I'd actually go outside of your district because then it's yours. And if you were to leave and go to another district, you wouldn't lose all your stuff left behind. You would get to keep it. That's such an important um, bit of information, Tammy. Um, one of the things that I love about Edmodo is that you basically are provided unlimited library um, storage space within their site. And you can put any kind of file up in their library up to 100 megabytes. So I take full advantage and put everything of mine in their library so that I have access to it from wherever. All right, next up we have Louise. I was just going to piggyback on what uh, Tammy was talking about. Um, when I started blogging with my classroom three years ago, I set up a classroom blog that I just continuously use. Every year I just keep adding to it. So it's kind of become a digital portfolio of the last two or three years in my classroom. And then the same thing with the kid blogs. Uh, it's just something that I've set up and that I can just go back to every year and easily just add my new students and, and work from there. And then as Paula mentioned, Edmodo is the same thing. Um, you can add your students for the, the, cur the current year, but all of the, the things that you store in the library can be there and stay there for you. And then I've been utilizing Dropbox a lot as well because yeah, you, every year you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. You want to be able to use the same things and add to them, but um, you want to also have access to what you've already done because if you're like me, you forget. <laughs> so I need to go back and review everything and see what I've done and see how I can make it better every year. That's my goal is to make it better every year um, and just build on what I've already done. Yeah, I found that I was um, curating my resources in so many different places, so I've decided to try to stick basically to two, which is the Edmodo Library and then as much as I can on Google Drive. All right, thank you, Louise. Okay, Tammy, it looks like your hand's up, so you have the mic. Tammy, just push the talk button under the audio video.
Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, can you hear me now? Okay, great. Uh, I apologize in advance if I cough. I've been avoiding talking, uh, taking the mic because I have a cough. But I wanted to kind of uh, bring this up at a, another question that you had too, um, over um, what should be, what you should have in your classroom, uh, or what tools or something like that. That other question. I actually provide professional development, so I teach teachers, and a lot of the teachers that I teach, and I'm in Alaska, and a lot of the teachers that I teach come in, and um, they have um, a fear of blended learning. And then when we start getting into our classes or our discussions or workshops, they start feeling like, oh, well, I already do this. I, and, and so I think that one of the things that we really need to have when we begin um, talking about blended learning or, or trying to implement blended learning is just try to put away the fear um, and, and have a very flexible and open attitude so that when the teachers begin trying different um, strategies or different tools, it's okay if they don't work perfectly or if it's okay if maybe the, the students know a little bit more about it or a lot more about it than you do. Let the students help you. So I guess the, the main point I want to make is, is the attitude that comes into using blended learning because I think that's key and has to kind of be in place before you really start uh, a lot of the other strategies and, and tools. Yes, Tammy, that's so true. Um, one of the things that I find that's really helpful with my students, I don't have time to learn every tool in depth. You know, so what I do is I um, play with it uh, enough to understand what my students can use it for. And then the first time that they have access to it, they're given um, a playtime, basically, to go learn the bells and whistles of that tool and to come back the next day and come up to our interactive whiteboard and share what they've learned. And then it's added to our toolkit as one of the um, sites that they can use when they're going to create uh, something for their next project. Thank you. All right, um, our next thing is, what role do you think assessments should play in the blending, blended learning environment? Um, I've seen in the chat lots of talk about rubrics and e-portfolios and things like that. And I just wanted other people to have a chance to share more in depth their thoughts about the assessment part of blended learning. So raise your hands. Thanks, Maureen. Okay, the mic is now yours. Okay. Um, I think assessment is an incredibly important part for any teaching learning that we do in school. And unless we have that piece in place before we start or have thought it through, then we don't have a good way to measure what the kids are learning. One of the ways I've seen for blended learning is to have um, a pre-assessment and an exit ticket. And the kids are assessing themselves. Remember, blending learning, we also have personalized a lot. So it's not a one test or one quiz for everyone. It's their own personal growth. So I, I really think assessments have to be in line with the state or Common Core or whatever standards your school is going for and have to be in place and thought through before you start with something new like blended learning may be in your classroom. Thank you so much, Maureen. All right, Patty, it's your turn. Well, hi, I just wanted to um, mention with the idea of formative assessment that even something like Google Docs, being able to jump into a shared document, uh, something that the students are doing, and give them feedback that um, you may not have time to say these things to them in person. There might be too many kids in the class, but you can throw some comments in there and send them uh, in the right direction, uh, or you know, just encourage them to keep doing what they're doing. And you can even add audio comments to it. So um, I think the formative assessment is uh, 
really key, and I think a lot of us need to do more of that. Thanks, Patty. Yes, I've seen um, where teachers, whether it's, um, again, on their website or their wiki or Edmodo or whatever, they use a very short Google form as kind of an exit ticket for the day, and that gives you some great formative assessment. All right, um, and Karen, it's nice to see you here, and please take the mic. Hi everybody, um, it's Karen. I'm in Surrey, British Columbia, Canada. I teach grade one and my kids have a lot of choice and so we have a blended classroom and they can choose digital and non-digital tools to learn. But for us it's all about the really big ideas and so assessment always goes back to those big ideas and um, for us formative assessment is huge and so my kids are often showing me how to, what they understand about a concept and whether they put it on their blogs or whether they just create it non-digitally or we just meet in a conference. Um, but it's that ongoing, it's the ongoing assessment. What I like about using digital tools is that my kids can put their work up on their blogs and I can assess it right or wrong and decide to put the post up public or private depending on what the post is. And there's, and that's where the teaching comes from. I'm so anti-summative, though I know I have to have summative assessment, but for me it should be all about from an assessment. And blended learning just makes it that much easier to assess your kids because it's coming at you all the time. So I'll stop talking. Thanks so much, Karen. All right, Susie, I really am excited that you're taking the mic and I want to hear your thoughts. Well, the reason I said I thought this was harder is because I, I think it's more difficult to assess authentic learning in the ways that our administrators and our legislators want us to do. So I'm just so impressed with all the different avenues people have given as ways to truly measure this. As educators, you guys are great for understanding it, but it's the people outside that will want to see, okay, well, how many points did they get, or you know, how, how can we measure this on standardized testing? So I'm just real impressed with all the suggestions everybody's given. Susie, do you think it's possible that if we uh, move away from uh, the traditional report report card system and move more towards a standard-based reporting system that um, it would fit better with blended learning? Well, that's interesting coming from a state or Indiana where we've just thrown out the common core standards and we're rewriting them again. Um, yeah, and, and even if it's I don't even know if we have we have standards based report cards in some of our schools and they are so bogged down with so many different standards. I like the idea of showing what the kids have achieved, but that then just figuring out okay, which which standards are we going to say are on this? So, we're back to the drawing board in Indiana, huh? Okay. So let's see, I think, was that my last one? Nope, have one more. What are some classroom management strategies you could share that support active learning in a blended classroom environment? So, um, you know, what are the, um, the ins and outs of doing this every day in your classroom? How do the kids move from, you know, the, 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 the teacher-based lecture setting to a more, um, rotational base thing or a flex program or whatever it is that you're using. Please raise your hand and share your thoughts on that with us. Thanks. Okay, Patty, your hand's up. Do you want to answer this one? Well, actually, I forgot to take my hand down from the last time. But um, as long as I'm here, I'll just say that um, I noticed Karen's uh, comment about uh, that she doesn't have to give grades. And I think it would be really great if we could um, use more performance-based assessment uh, rather than have to take the blended environment and somehow fit it into the traditional uh, grading model. Um, but as far as classroom strategies, I think because in my situation, um, you know, being the tech teacher in the computer lab and only seeing them once a week, I don't know that um, my strategies might apply to uh, a regular classroom situation. But I just try to make all the tools available to them as they need them for additional support. 
thanks so much for sharing that. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, Patty. All right, Shannon, your turn, and then I think we're going to have to do our wrap-up for the show today. Okay, thanks. Just briefly, I teach uh, French and Spanish, and one of the ways that uh, I do like to see that everybody is participating is I have them uh, uh, collaboratively write a dialogue. And so each one has a certain amount that they have to do. The dialogue can't take place unless everybody does their part. So that's just one little way that I do. Thank you again so much for sharing. This has been an awesome experience. I am going to, oh wait, I got one more real quickly. In a perfect world, what would it look like in your classroom? Anybody want to talk about if we had everything we needed? And then we will do our wrap up. I'm so sorry. All right, Shannon, your hand's still up. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'm not sure how to what this is, but RTX, it's your turn. Just cl just click on the talk button above the participants window. You should be hearing me now. My name is Zenja. I always put my initials and then I forget. I love the future that we are looking at because every day I go to class and I imagine my students coming in. I have a challenge question of the day on the board. They get to use their devices, the few notebooks that I might have, or pads or tablets. They get to work in their small groups and try to solve this problem using whatever methods work for them, and then getting to share that and do that analysis, reasoning, defending, critiquing, and realizing that school is about the thinking process behind whatever it is that you are doing. So you can take that and apply it to other aspects of life. That is so true. And thank you, Zenja, for sharing that with us. So it sounds like those of us that are trying to use a blended model are also blending lots of different tools and devices within our classroom to um, facilitate that. So. Uh, Peggy at this time, or Lorna, um, I guess we are to the point where we need to wrap this up. So I'm going to get off the mic. Thank you, everyone who participated. And we are so thrilled that so many of you came and actually took the mic and shared with us. Thank you again. And thank you, Paula. This has been so exciting. You are an awesome facilitator. And I can't thank everyone in the room enough for all of the great sharing, both on the mic and in the chat. We will be posting the chat log, so you'll definitely want to go back and check that. And I will add any of the links you shared to our live binder. We are thrilled that you are with us. We will definitely do another show like this on a different topic because it is so exciting. And I want to give a special shout out to our Classroom 2.0 live advisory team. We've been meeting for the last few months, once a month, and so many great suggestions for presenters and topics have been shared by them, and it is just going to enrich all of our shows. So huge thank you to all of you that are serving on the advisory team. Next week, we have a great show coming up, and Felix, uh, and I don't even know for sure how to say his last name, but Hakamino. Um, is going to be sharing a number of things, one of which is Teacher PD for student one-to-one -one tech integration. But he is just fabulous. He's a tech director with mobile learning. And so I know he's going to have lots of great things to share with us. On March 1st, Melissa Murphy is going to come and share all about some examples of using Google Forms in the classroom. That will be a perfect follow-up to today's session where it's so easy to blend. I think it was Louise that mentioned that, that the Google Forms are so easy to use in a blended environment. 
Then we're going to have two weeks of shows on the topic of donors choose. If you're trying to figure out how you can get more technology in your classroom, you need to come to these shows. The first one by Laura Candler and Francie Kugelman will be all about what it is and how it works, lots of details, and the uh, one on March 15th will be the fourth chat team of Rebecca Burkoff, Jenny Jones, and Paula Nagel sharing their success success stories about donors choose. And then on March 22nd, we have Erin Klein as our March featured teacher. So lots of fabulous shows coming up, and we hope you'll all join us. I do want to let all of you know that there's another great virtual conference coming up. And you need to check this out. It's Aussie Live. It's originating in Australia, which means you have to check their schedule to find out what time it actually starts in the US. Because it's really Friday, February 21st, and Saturday, February 22nd in the US. So uh, check that out. Thank you, Shambles, for posting the link. I appreciate that. And remember that Steve Hargadon has started a new site called The Learning Revolution. And that's a place where you can learn all about these upcoming virtual conferences, webinars. The calendar is there. And it's a great way to connect. You'll get an email once a week for that. And the reminders are excellent. And now I'm going to turn this over to Lori so I can share a few more links in the chat with you. Thanks, Peggy. You can nominate a featured teacher at this form, um, the tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher nominate without the E at the end. And you can nominate yourself as well. There were so many wonderful suggestions and comments in the uh, live mic session today. Some of you might want to volunteer yourselves as a featured teacher. Uh, also, when you exit the show, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey link should come up. And that link is here on this page as well. Uh, you can get the link from the chat box as well or in the live binder. Um, it's in many places as well as I think on the, the website. And please, when you do complete the survey, if you're looking for the uh, PD certificate, uh, use a personal email rather than a school email. And make sure you type your email address correctly. Uh, the link for the survey is here, tinyurl.com slash cr20live survey. Sometimes it doesn't open when you leave the room. Most of the time it does. Here are the uh, the link and the collections for the video collection and audio collection for the res or, uh, archives in iTunes U. They're both available there. Um, also, as you can see here, there's an RSS feed of show archives as well. So there are many, many different ways to get the, the show archives, to get the recordings, uh, including the full Collaborate recording and then some other versions on the uh, Classroom 2.0 Live site. So special thanks to Paula Noggle and everyone who participated in today's conversation, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, and to everyone who participated in today's show, as well as to Blackboard Collaborate for providing the, the platform that we use each week. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>